Welcome to episode 33 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. Today, our plan is to talk about yoga alignment rules that don't make sense. And we know that if you, if you're a semi-regular listener to our podcast, you have probably picked up on the fact that in many of our episodes, we kind of inevitably end up talking about a yoga alignment cue or two that maybe warrant some questioning, just kind of based on the broader topic that we're focusing on in that particular episode. So um, this kind of topic tends to come up throughout things that we talk about. But what's different about today's episode is that today, we have actually just picked out a, a wide selection of yoga alignment cues from a broad array of yoga asana examples. And we've kind of put them all together to talk about collectively, like as a whole. That's kind of the focus of this episode. And specifically, just to be clear, when we say that these may be some yoga alignment cues that quote, don't make sense. Just to be clear that what we're talking about when we say that is whether or not they make sense uh, biomechanically is all that we mean. There may be other reasons that they make sense, but to the extent that we give these cues or hear these cues backed up with uh, bi like biomechanics-based rationales, that's kind of the realm that we're talking about today. So like a movement science-based perspective on some of these yoga alignment rules. And the main thread or theme that will tie these yoga alignment rules together today is that because we know there are like, there are tons of many yoga alignment rules out there that again, maybe war uh, warranted questioning, but the ones we picked out today are extra special because these are yoga alignment cues that we tend to find in the yoga world where we have say two kind of opposing alignment cues, but they're about a very similar or the same position within a generally within a yoga asana. So basically like two opposite cues that maybe tell us to do opposite things. But when we take a step back and we look at what we're actually talking about, it's kind of talking about the same movement or the same position. And so we thought that would be like an interesting focus to take a look at these alignment cues through because if it does turn out that like there are these same movements or similar movements where opposite alignment rules have been kind of established, that may suggest to us that maybe the alignment rules that we tend to give or tend to hear may not be necessary. It kind of depends. Of course, we need to examine these through that lens of movement science, but they may not be necessary. And it may indicate that like, perhaps it may not be so important the way that we align our bodies in some of these, uh, some of these yoga poses, at least coming from that biomechanics lens. So that is basically what we're up to today, kind of inconsistencies oh. in yoga alignment rules. And I did want to point out that we were given this great idea or suggested this great idea to do a, uh, to do a focus on this uh, by our friend, Sarah Page. And Sarah Page is a, a movement instructor and she's really awesome. And she uh, she wrote to us and just kind of brought, brought this idea to our attention. It's something that she's been thinking about as far as like noticing these inconsistencies. And she suggested a couple, so, uh, a couple examples of inconsistencies within yoga asana and alignment rules that she had noticed. And we plan to talk about those examples that Sarah Page brought up, but we're not going to dive into them right away. We're planning to get to them toward the uh, toward the end of our episode because they're a little bit on the specific side, uh, but we definitely do want to address them. So, but we would just like to acknowledge and thank uh, Sarah for suggesting this great idea because you know there's there are a lot of lenses through which we can look at the way we talk about the body and movement in the yoga practice. But this idea of looking at kind of inconsistencies or opposite cues in the same movement is just uh, unique and kind of fun. And I think eye-opening for us and for our listeners. So before we dive in to these yoga alignment rules that we're suggesting might not make sense, 
before we dive into them, we just wanted to remind you of ways that you can support us and our work with this podcast. And the first way that you could support us is to subscribe to my email list. That'll keep you up to date on just everything that Travis and I are up to. And you can do that at jennyrawlings.com slash newsletter. And the link to that is in the show notes. Another way that you can support us is uh, by considering joining Travis and I for our Strength for Yoga remote group training offering, which is a monthly strength program that we designed to make strength training accessible, relevant, important, and engaging for specifically for yogis. It can be open to anybody, but we really designed it with like a yoga practitioner as the focus. So you can feel free to use the code podcast 30 for 30% off your first month in remote group training for us and you uh, with us, you could sign up on my website, johnnyrollings.com. The link is in the show notes. And lastly, to support us on our podcast, you can also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it and leave us a rating or a review. So with all of that said, Travis, uh, what, what's the first alignment rule on our list to take a look at today? The first alignment that we're going to, or alignment cue that we're going to talk about is the relationship between where your wrists should be relative to your shoulders in plank with an analogy mm -hmm. to down dog. So I think that the mm -hmm, most mm -hmm. common cue here is that the wrists need to be directly underneath the shoulders and anywhere else we put a red X all over it, whether the hands are farther from the feet. So you're in mm -hmm. a longer plank and then your hands would be outside. You know, if you dropped a vertical line from your shoulders down, they would be farther away from your feet. Or right. if you were shifted forward such that your wrists were behind your shoulders and then you were in a bit of a shorter plank maybe, or just had your weight shifted. But then right. if we look at down dog. So that's the, for the, the rule that's been established is that in plank, we need to be joint stacked, right? Like the joint of the shoulder right the over the joint of the wrist. Yeah. <laughs> right. So joint stacked, if you drew a straight line down with gravity through both of the joints, the center of each joint is passing through that line. Mm -hmm. that's so supposed that's, to be safest and best right and then if we look at down dog we have more of this tent shape po position mm -hmm. where our we have a straight line mostly from the hips through the shoulders through the hands but it's on a diagonal right like an inverted right. v mm -hmm. so the hands are going to be ahead of the shoulders in that position that's right. So roughly still in a line, but it's not a vertical line. And we wouldn't call that joint stacked, right? As far as like the shoulder to wrist relationship I in down dog. I suppose not. I mean, if you just think of joint stacked being straight line perpendicular to the ground in line with gravity, if we're calling that joint stacked, then mm -hmm. the down dog position isn't joint stacked unless your definition of joint stacked is just like drawing a line through the joints and having them all be in a line. I don't know. That's true. The way that I tend to see it, at least taught like in the yoga world, in my experience is it's more about that vertical line that like the forces mm -hmm. are traveling straight down with gravity, you yeah. know, fr like in plank from the shoulder down to the wrist. And that's safe because all the forces are traveling mm -hmm. through the stacked up bones. Yeah. So in that case, if you wanted to be joint stacked and down dog, you'd have to shift such that you're, you were in less shoulder flexion mm -hmm. so that your arms were straight down, but then they wouldn't be in line with the rest of your torso. Yeah. You basically, or you would be in such a short down dog. Maybe you would, you could walk your hands in. So you were in such a short down dog that you were now in a forward fold. That, exactly. And then you would have that vertical line. A, exactly. A nice, a nice wrists underneath shoulders, down dog in forward fold. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this is this example where um, this is an inconsistency in an alignment rule that we've identified, which is just if the rule is joint stacking is important, like vertically, right? Like shoulder straight over wrist. And we talk about that in plank pose. We tend to not want people to be in plank with the shoulders forward of the wrist or back from the wrist because that's not joint stacked. 
then the inconsistency inconsistency comes up when we then look at down dog and that's a completely not joint stock pose like just inherently if you did want to make a joint stock you basically would turn it into as you just described a forward fold at the back like at the back of the mat or you turn it back into plank where the shoulders come back forward basically right. And, um, but neither of those is down dog, down dog is down dog, yet we don't seem to hear, or um, you know, the same rule about joint stacking applied to down dog. So it's like, I, why, I think, why not? I think oftentimes if you do see somebody who's has that more shoulder over wrist position, you go over to them and you, you know, assist their hips or at the upper back to try to get them into You're the right. more inverted V shape. That's right. Like often that, that uh, yoga teacher system, like pressing the hips back or something to mm -hmm. get that backward reaching energy. Yeah. So it's like, we, we kind of know when we step back and think about it, we know that we don't really honestly really care about that joint stock rule of shoulder over wrist when it's in down dog. So why does it, why does it seem to be that we treat it as important when it's plank pose? Like that's the inconsistency with this one. Right. And we and even I'm, go so far as to you know, alternate, alter it if it's in, if we're seeing that in down dog to make it not joint stacked, quote unquote. You're totally right. Like we're not applying the same rule yet. If we see someone in plank and they're not joint stacked, we often alter them so that they are joint stacked. Right. So just, that's like a good, I think a good example of this inconsistency, like this would be, this would be more of like the same, um, yoga alignment rule, but then not applied in two different positions where you would think if it really mattered in plank, then it should matter in down dog, but clear, but it doesn't. So perhaps the fact that there is this inconsistency just might lend us to, you know, just kind of question like, well, where does that, what's behind that rule that we tend to hear about plank pose? Like that's really, I think what this is about is about the plank pose, not so much mm -hmm. about the down dog side of the equation. Uh, you know, what if it doesn't matter when it's in another pose, why does it matter in plank pose? Maybe it doesn't matter. I that's that's my bias because I think that you can do a plank with your shoulders forward, and we call mm -hmm. that actually a planche lean in a in a right. calisthenic calisthenics context. Or you could do a long lever plank with your I, did I say shoulders forward the first time? That's what I meant. I think you said that. If your yeah. shoulders lean forward and you go into more wrist extension, then we call that a planche lean. If you walked mm -hmm. your hands out to create a longer lever, I would call that a long lever plank. And that is a really challenging position for the that core, is. the abs to hold that plank. And I, th I love both of those <laughs> positions and uh, totally. I, I frequently practice them. So I'm, and I haven't, and I've seen you prescribe yet. those positions, I think, <laughs> to some of your like training clients. You haven't exploded totally, yet. Yeah. yeah. And neither yeah, of your clients. No, I've, right, yet. Um, but if, yeah, if people are working towards some more advanced calisthenics, well, actually, both of those mm -hmm. are moderately advanced just in the plank. Right. Uh, but if you right. wanted to do even more crazy things, then those would be good progressions, good options if we're talking about plank and yoga and the emphasis on joint stacking, now you're bringing up a couple of plank variations that we commonly see in like calisthenics, which uh, in that realm, it's a similar, you know, plank is a similar position, but we have these variations on the alignment and they're actually encouraged and they're not cautioned that they're inherently injurious, right? Right. It's just something that you work up to. Yeah, right, right, right. You don't necessarily throw yourself into a uh, shoulders leaning forward playing. Yeah, right away, because, right? you know, you do need to condition your wrists a little bit for that. And similarly, you don't throw yourself into a long lever plank if you haven't demonstrated proficiency in a right. regular lever plank. <laughs> that makes so much make sense. Wrong. They're just options. Exactly. So I think that's a good example of an inconsistency where we see, you know, similar shape in, in a different movement modality, but just like right. the, that whole joint stack thing is not this rule that's like held hard and fast too, it seems like. But then if, even if you look within yoga, mm -hmm. there is an example <laughs> where we do shift forward, right? 
That's right. And you brought this one up and I thought this was so insightful. It hadn't even occurred to me. This is a really good one. Um, where, so we tend to say in plank that you, you must be joint stacked for safety, you know, like that's safest shoulders over wrists in yoga, but then also in yoga, we tend to see this instruction given for chaturanga that when you lower into chaturanga from plank pose, you're supposed to shift forward, like shift your shoulders forward and then lower down. <laughs> right, Travis? You know right. what I'm talking about? Although we don't always coach it or cue it that way. Yeah, you mean like you and I don't always or yeah. Yeah. And and we've done some we've done some work looking at that specific issue before, right? Like we have a whole there's a YouTube video where we talk about that that I think it's called we can link it in the show notes, but it's called like should we shift should we shift forward mm -hmm. onto the toes in Chaturanga? I think that's what it's called. Um, because that's often the cue. Sometimes it's like shift your shoulders forward, but sometimes the wording is like shift forward onto your toes. And then our focus is maybe on thing. Exactly. It's the same thing, but the wording might be different. Uh, and I think you and I, we we might question whether that's important. We have questioned whether that's important, like to shift forward to in order to lower into Chaturanga. Uh, and we again, we can link that in the show notes. But just kind of for the purposes of this conversation, it's just like, well, why would that be okay? Like that coming out of joint stacked before you lower into Chaturanga? that tends to be emphasized in the yoga world. Like, why is that okay? But then in plank pose, we must not right. do that. And the, the reason for that, and we don't have to get too much into it, but it's just that mm -hmm. you're trying to create a nice right angle at the elbow. That's right. So in it's like, oh, right? we need, we need to do this thing. That's not allowed in this other <laughs> pose, but to create this visual angle right. in the bottom or in chaturanga, that's, that is the pose. Right. But like, do, please don't notice for a second how we're breaking the the quote unquote <laughs> rule in the in the pose that we started in. Precise. You put that perfectly. That's exactly it. And I think you also just really um, named something kind of important that I think is going on here and maybe mm. will be a theme with many of these things we talk about today, but aesthetics and visuals. Right. And like angles like right angles or straight lines like we talked about the line from the shoulder through the wrist and that and that in my experience that's taught like joint stock is supposed to be a vertical line like not a slanted line right it's like how all these things it look from the outside looks good in a picture exactly our eyes but seem that... to like to see straight lines and right angles right, right. yeah but is that really the most I I important or relevant Mm -hmm. when it comes to safety or performance precisely and i think we we you and i you and i might suggest that it's not necessarily and that safety and performance uh may be about many other things and many other factors and kind of what True. a pose may end up looking like in the end once we take those considerations into into consideration um, it may not look like right angles and straight lines it might but it might not and it's we might not place our first priority on right angles and straight lines, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you wanted to go to town, <laughs> but just don't say it's totally. because you're doing this for some biomechanical reason when exactly you're really just doing it because you want to have a pretty line. <laughs> exactly. And I, think I was trying to figure to out what logical fallacy that is, <laughs> but <laughs> It, it's uh, not quite the post hoc fallacy because that's like a, you know, something happens after so something funny. else and then you attribute it to the something before. But it's just like, oh. oh, well, we've been cueing it this way and now we're ascribing some other reason to it to add some more meaning on it from a yes. safety or performance standpoint. But it's really just because it's how it's always been done traditionally. And that tradition is probably based on something aesthetic. You're so you put that so perfectly. Yes. I'm not sure if I could identify um, what logical fallacy that is either, but I think that's it. And I think you just named it. At least this is, this isn't my observation and, you know, long time experience in the yoga world is I, I tend to find that we have these shapes on our hands that have been taught to us that we learn to practice and we learn to teach in our teacher trainings. And ultimately I think they boil down to like, we teach these shapes because that's just the shape 
you know, like that's the pose in the book. That's the yoga asana. We all identify with it. It has meaning to us on that level. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like that is completely fine in my opinion to teach a shape mm -hmm. just because it's a shape. But then I find that I think a, a lot of times we want to, we want it to matter more or be about more than we're teaching this pose this way, because that's just the shape, you know, we want it to be about more. So um, I guess post, I don't, don't know that it's post hoc fallacy, but it's post hoc, like after the fact, we then come yeah. up with these like biomechanical justifications for why we teach it that way. But it really can it's boil some down some kind to, of like, fallacy. <laughs> yeah. The fallacy of like wanting to make something more important or meaningful than it than it really is or or yeah. to matter in a different way than it originally did. What fallacy is if that? If only we knew Latin. <laughs> exactly. We could make a new fallacy on the spot for that. Totally. Maybe, uh, it'll come to uh, us. maybe it's yeah. Sort of like appeal to appeal to tradition, mm -hmm. but not. It's kind of like the opposite. But it's like the opposite. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, we're we're we don't want to appeal tradition, so we're making up new reasons why. One hundred percent. It's like the inverse of a, it's like um, appealing to tradition isn't good enough. Like that's not a good enough reason. Yeah, to maybe we should way. be appealing to tradition, <laughs> right? Or just when acknowledging comes... that mm -hmm. it, this is tradition and it's not necessarily due to some performance or in uh, safety. Precisely. So I think this plank pose example is like a good way to kind of kick off what we're talking about with like these um, inconsistencies, you know, like we tend to hear these alignment rules. Often we just kind of memorize them. And we, if we're teachers, we might repeat them. And uh, they just kind of become like just normal, um, just language in the yoga world that I think many of us take for granted. And I know this is also something plenty of us do, probably all of us do just in daily life in general too. We just hear things and often we don't examine them and then we just keep thinking them or, or reciting them. And that's very normal, but I think, um, you know, like pulling these out and taking a deeper look within this like yoga movement context can help us as yogis become more critical thinkers, but also just as livers of life in the society in general. Yeah, I think it's hard. <laughs> You know, you get the manual for your yeah. teacher training and here's the long list of cues. Are you really going to go through it? And whether it's yourself or with your instructor, be like, well, why is this this way? Why is this this way? Like at, at the beginning, you sort of have to accept it at face value. I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it would be too painstaking to question everything. Um, right. But it may be over time. And it would time, frustrate your teacher. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I, I would be that student in a yoga teacher training. Why is this yeah. this way? I would Knowing be. Knowing you, uh, I think you would be, yeah. Yeah, you'd, you'd never learn all the poses and all the cues mm -hmm. if you were trying to do that at first. So it's I definitely don't fault yoga, teacher tra yoga teachers who are learning to accept the yes. cues as, as rules at first, but then over time, I do, like you said, I think it's important to start questioning or just asking yourself why, why you're saying yeah. what you're saying and why you're saying is the way it is. hundred percent. And, and it doesn't even have to, for us doing that questioning, we don't even have to go back and make it about what anyone taught us, like in our training or what we like, it doesn't need to be blamey about who taught us yeah. this or where we learned it it could just be about our own process and evolution. Like, why am I choosing to say, is it because just because I learned it from someone and I trusted them, you know, or is it that I really have examined why I'm saying this? I think it's helpful to expose yourself to those other movement schools of thought yeah. so that you can see examples maybe of where you're seeing positions in a calisthenics or in a strength yeah. training context or in any other movement practice that break the rules of rules in air quotes rules <laughs> that you've learned in yoga so that then you can see oh there might be another way or it doesn't have to be this way wow i think that's a great point for like the value in exposing ourselves and being open to yeah learning from a variety of modalities maybe we resonate and identify with yoga the most i mean i think ma many of us do many of us in our audience but that doesn't mean that there isn't value and tons to be gained from diving into and being open to other modalities as well. That's such a good point. 
Um, and I also just wanted to say, and and then maybe we'll move on to our next uh, yoga alignment rule we wanted to look at. But just, I think this is all good, kind of just setting the tone for, you know, why we're talking about all this stuff. But that I also find that no matter what, when we take a moment to examine these things that we've just kind of maybe had just become into a habit of just saying or thinking about our alignment rules, we, upon examination, if we really look at it, we may very well find that we actually agree with the cue and maybe we find good rationale or justification for it. You know, we may have just been taught like, this is how you should, you should teach it. And we were never given a reason. And then when we try to investigate for a reason, we find uh, a reason that supports that. So then we continue doing it. But we also might find that one, if we take a moment to examine that there, we may find that we don't actually see actual support, like scientific support for these cues within that biomechanical realm. And in that case, that may give us the freedom to just realize that it doesn't have to be that way. We may have more options available. And um, some of these rules just might be unnecessary. I think that can be kind of liberating for us as teachers and practitioners. And yeah, so that's that's kind of what this is all about today. And really kind of as a overarching theme in general for so much of our work together. So, okay, so we had plank pose and the joint stacked rule of shoulders over wrists. And then we saw where somehow we didn't apply that rule when it came to down dog. And we also saw that even within plank, we break that rule, like when we shift forward and then lower to chaturanga, if we choose to teach that, but many people do. We kind of break the rule, but we don't seem to really see that or reconcile that. So that's an example of inconsistency there. Uh, Now, another, we have a little list to look at today. Second on our list is actually another joint stacked uh, alignment rule. And what's this one, Travis? This one is similar. It, we're going to talk similar, about yeah. side plank. So mm-hmm. in side plank, we're told to, again, stack our shoulder over our wrist. Now That's we're right. oriented differently. Torso is differently oriented relative to gravity, but the arm is pretty much the same. Right. So that's side plank. And mm-hmm. so similarly, we're told, well, don't go too long. Like, don't move your hand farther <laughs> away from your feet or farther in. Too but closed. then yeah. when we flip over, flip our side plank. They usually say flip your down dog. But if we if we move into wild thing, then yes. we see that the shoulder is no longer directly over the wrist. And it's kind of and off oblique. at some, yeah, oblique, non-stacked position, but nobody fusses over that. Exactly. That's perfectly said. Exactly. So this is an example. I think this is like a really like a perfect example of, um, yeah, it's just like, it's an inconsistency. Like, why does it matter in side plank? Why are we real sticklers about the shoulder has to be directly over the wrist? And if it's not, you'll injure the wrist or you'll injure the shoulder. Those are usually the, the cautions that I tend to hear. But then why does it not matter in wild thing? Like, because in wild thing, if you can picture it, And maybe just to point out, um, obviously, this is a a podcast where we're talking, so we're not able to like, you know, we're not physically demoing, but we're kind of assuming that our yoga familiar audience can picture these movements. And we'll do our best to try to describe ones that might be a little obtuse to picture. But in Wild Thing, if you can picture it, you know, we often start in plank, or as you mentioned, Travis, we sometimes start in down dog, and then we like flip the dog. But what you end up with once you're in Wild Thing is you're in this position where it's um it's like oblique uh, as far as the shoulder to wrist angle or yeah line and that often like the hand is maybe a little bit uh, up above from the shoulder and you're kind of turning away and there's really no um, joint stacking to be had between the shoulder and the wrist there uh, but it's like that's not it's not a problem there so um you know like like what's that about like that's another inconsistency if it doesn't matter in wild thing does it really matter in side plank I don't think so. I, I've, I've practiced and prescribed side plank variations where the feet are on furniture sliders and you, you're in forearm side plank and you actually slide in and out of that, uh, like stacked position to a longer side plank. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, (laughs) I think that's That's just fine. 
But basically, yeah, forearm side plank, if our listeners can picture that. Um, but instead of just having your feet parked in place the way we normally do it, you have your feet on, yes, yeah, something that slides, and then you can slide out into a longer forearm side plank. And that's going to be like, would you say that could be a good like lat work? Like kind of like, like kind of a pulling, kind of a pulling yeah. exercise? Yeah, it's very similar to <laughs> the part of the range of motion of a pull-up. I was just thinking, as you were describing why it. Why it's so hard. <laughs> Exactly. Like it's a similar movement to, to a pull up in a way. And also maybe like a, a this is kind of a, a gym machine movement, but a lat pull down. Many of our listeners may right. be familiar with the kind of, again, you grab a bar over your head and you pull down and your position is different, you know, to grab rel rel relative to gravity. It's not the same as side plank, but it is a similar, um, you know, you're pulling and you're moving through this full range where there's joint stacking just isn't something that matters there between like the shoulder and the elbow or the shoulder and the wrist. Mm -hmm. uh, and another, uh, another strength exercise we were thinking to point out when it came to this kind of side plank wild thing discrepancy and the joint stacking question, this strength exercise is one that um, we find Travis that this isn't such a common one, like out there in the strength world in general, but it is an actual strength exercise and it's one we use in our strength for yoga, right? What exercise mm -hmm. is this one? It's called a victory press and it's mm -hmm. called a victory press because the, the way that maybe it's most commonly done, if you search YouTube, you might see somebody holding two dumbbells and instead of doing a straight overhead or shoulder or military press where the dumbbells go from shoulder to directly overhead in a stacked mm -hmm. position, you mm -hmm. press out to make a letter V at the top. So dumbbell nice. to shoulder to opposite arm, you've, you've made a letter V. So instead of having you, you in a stacked position, you're off at an angle. And that what that does is it makes the shoulders work harder in the top position. Mm -hmm. Because if the dumbbell were directly over the shoulder, there's no longer a moment arm for the shoulders to have to work in. Uh, whereas if you press out the entire, t or if you press out on that diagonal, then you get shoulder work even in that top range. Uh, the way we happen to do it in our programming is usually with a, an angled barbell. So you would have the bar like um, jammed into the corner of a, where two walls meet and then you can press up and away with the barbell and it's so exactly the same motion and the reason that we like that is because it is so relevant so for wild thing wild thing exact it's it's exact it's like a super similar arm and shoulder position and um i just wanted to mention just so that we don't like uh intimidate anyone who's listening who might be interested in our strength for yoga program we certainly include the barbell variation of victory press but we also we know a lot oh. of our people don't use barbells or have access to them so we also have a resistance band uh version yeah. of the victory press right and that might very, actually I mean, be the best version. <laughs> it just feels <laughs> nice to press. I do press. really like how it feels. You can step on the band with your opposite mm -hmm. leg and press up and away on the diagonal and it has like a That's nice right. opposite leg to, yeah. you know, opposite shoulder. Opposite arm reaching out. That's so true. And that's just uh, just to point out that that exercise can be done in a pretty accessible way as far as equipment goes. Like you can just do it with yeah. resistance band. And, but yeah, like Good with our point. strength, <laughs> yeah, with our strength for yoga programming, since it's, it's, uh, it's really tailored to, as I mentioned in the intro, like we try to make it meaningful specifically for yogis. That's why we include that exercise. Cause even though it's not the most common one you tend to see in gyms everywhere, it's a great one for yogis because it really supports build shoulder strength for wild thing and also side plank, uh, you know, because it's similar. It's not exactly the same, but similar. And I would suggest that, that it also might, might build strength for something like wheel, like that overhead, getting mm. into full wheel. Like, so again, similar. I know wheel yeah. is more straight overhead. I but think wild have... thing is like the halfway in between side yeah. plank and wheel, right? <laughs> totally. Totally. So working on like that angle definitely benefits wild thing, but could also have some spillover to those like related asanas. 
And that's why, that's like why we like to map these strength exercises onto yoga asana and um, to try to just help support a yoga asana practice in general. But also, like you said, when you, when you kind of open your mind to different movement modalities outside of just the yoga world in general, then when you start to see something like the victory press and you feel that in your body and like how you can feel strong in that shape, then maybe we become a little less afraid or a little less attached to these rules that inside plank, you always must be joint stacked. And if you're an inch forward or an inch back, that's like going to mean certain doom for your shoulder and for your wrist, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. So, uh, yes. So that side plank joint stacked rule, and then we compare that to something like wild thing where for some reason we don't worry about it in wild thing. That's another example of like a, a yoga alignment inconsistency that we see across movements where that might, they might give us reason to just think like, well, why am I saying that the shoulder must be directly over the wrist in side plank? You know, like, is that actually important? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just like to throw out there and maybe you agree, Travis, um, we'll see what you think. But I just think uh, in general, I do like to teach side plank, you know, generally with the shoulder over the wrist, you know, so it's not to say, that everything could just be like all oh, willy nilly. It can be whatever you want. It's like side plank has a form and we're teaching this shape, you know? So I, I personally probably, you know, might cue something if I was teaching side plank to someone who is new to it, you know, like shoulder over wrist and, and find your shape. I may teach like a regression if someone's brand new to it. But um, I think that maybe more the overarching point though, is like, it's not that it's, it's wrong to teach shoulder over wrist. But maybe what we're questioning is like, and this can definitely happen in the yoga, um, the yoga world is like, we get to this level of it where it gets a little nitpicky, where, you know, it's like, it, it must be the center of the shoulder directly above the center of the wrist. And a yoga teacher might come up and really examine someone. And if they're a half inch off, they'll be like, you're, that's incorrect. That's bad alignment. Like move this, you know, a few millimeters. They're bringing to... the plumb line. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the plumb line. So does that kind of make sense? Like, you know, yeah, we have something we want to work around, like the base position mm -hmm. of side plank, but you know, maybe it doesn't yeah. have to be. It, so that might be the be... correct quote unquote way of doing it, but it doesn't mean that the other ways are dangerous, I think is the That's right. especially important point. And so if somebody's doing it in a different position, it could be worth pointing that out to them. But it could also be worth experimenting with those other positions. Oh, what does that feel like? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's harder. Oh, you're ready for that. Try, try that. Exactly. That's such a good point. Doesn't always have to be the one way. Precisely. Like once someone has done a bunch of side plank or a bunch of plank to like go back to our first example, you know, we tend to, with enough time, we build our strength there. And um, because yoga is only a body weight practice, like with enough time, we, we certainly plateau uh, in terms of building strength, you know, if we just keep doing these poses the same way all the time. So doing them the same way for a while to like build up the strength for the base pose makes a lot of sense. But then once you've got strength in regular joint stack plank or joint stack side plank, maybe you could actually benefit a lot from beginning to intentionally change it up a bit, right? For like you sure. said, like once more. Yeah. So and there's a lot of value there. Yeah. That's an easy way where you can take your plank to the next level without just holding it longer. Yeah, or side exactly. Plank. Exactly. Um, what do you think about moving on to another yoga alignment rule? So we can what's kinda, our next one? What's our, okay, so our next one, you and I talked about this. It's not a perfect example, but I think it's relevant here. Mm -hmm. So do you want to tell us about this one? Sure. So in wheel pose, we are traditionally instructed to have our feet uh, maybe hip width apart. Would you say that's accurate? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think and so, yeah. toes straight ahead. And just and then, to be clear, what wheel pose? Just so our listeners oh, so wheel it's a pose is full like... back bend. You start on your back with your hands behind your head, and then you lift off to create like a, a full. Arc. Um, what's that yeah. called? Yeah, like a big arch. Yeah, hands <laughs> yeah. on um, either side of your head. Just yeah, either side, and then you push up. Yeah, full back so, bend. So in that pose, we're instructed to have our toes forward and feet about hip width apart. And we are specifically 
told not to allow our toes to flare or our feet to go wide. And one or of like the- like our legs to go wide, right? Yeah. The thighs uh, to go wide. Mm-hmm. And one of the explanations, I suppose, yeah. that's given is that it will jam your SI joint. Mm -hmm. And I That's don't know right. what that means, but and maybe you can tell me what that means. But uh, that's, I, as far as I know, that's the, like, kind of the number one reason why not to do it. Or are there other reasons? That is the probably the most common reason I've experienced is, like, if you let the feet turn out and if you let the knees splay out and wheel, that, mm -hmm. yeah, that'll, quote, jam the SI joint or, or injure the SI joint, which that's the sacroiliac joint, in case anyone doesn't mm. know. It's where your sacrum and your pelvis meet, like, all the way down at the base of your spine. I also, I also hear cautions kind of uh, around just the low back in general, too, that it could be just... I don't know, compressive for the low back, bad for the low back. Um, but it's to the point where I'm sure many of our listeners will relate to this, where often wheel is taught. Uh, and wheel is also Urdhvadhanyarasana in Sanskrit, just, just FYI. But often that pose is taught where people are given a yoga block to hug in between their inner thighs, to mm. hug in so that they don't let the knees splay out. And this is taught as like, because this is, this will teach you to do the pose correctly. So you, you hug the block between your inner thighs, keep the feet pointing forward in parallel, and then you lift up and like you, you, know, you shouldn't drop the block kind of thing. Is yeah, often which is fine, but perhaps not <laughs> Well, you mean that's a fine variation to teach, but like the rationale yeah, for it like, maybe. Don't stop teaching that if you like that. Exactly. <laughs> but but yeah. the yeah. Be, teaching it because you're trying to prevent the SI joint from jamming, which is like the least <laughs> rigorous anatomical term that I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're contrasting that with what pose where we do okay. uh, allow the feet to go wide and knees to yeah. splay. So we're contrasting a uh, wheel with the feet turned out with a pose I'm sure our listeners know, which is sometimes called goddess pose. This is a standing pose. Sometimes it's called horse stance. Maybe there are other terms, but those are the most common I see. And that's a wide legged, uh, we might call it like a side facing pose because typically if you're on a yoga mat, you're facing the side of your mat, kind of in that family of like warrior two and side angle, like these side facing poses. So, um, yeah. So in goddess pose or horse stance, you've got wide legs, your feet are pointed away from one another, and then you bend your knees, uh, some amount, you know, the lower you go, the, the more challenging it is. But that's basically, and then there's some different arm variations you might do. But if we're just thinking about like the lower body, that's, do you think I described that, described that well? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, we call it sumo stance, in strength training. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. That like wide legged feet pointed out stance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we wanted to point that pose out. Now we know it's a little different than wheel. It's not a full back bend. Uh, you know, you're not in full spinal extension. And as you pointed out, Travis, you also um, are in some hip flexion in goddess pose, whereas you're in full hip extension in wheel. So there are those differences. Uh, I tend to find uh, in horse stance, I think I'll just call it horse stance, but we'll all know what we're, we're talking about. It could be goddess or whatever. But I find in horse stance, there are a lot of variations that are taught in that position because sometimes just hold, sit, standing there and holding it is great, but like sometimes it gets a little, um, a little boring and we want to change it up. And I find that like different spinal movements are often taught there. And one of them that I often see is like a version of cat cow which is, you know, that's flexing your spine and extending or, or back bending and rounding. So I would suggest that often we do see, or semi-often we do see a back bend added to horse, horse dance in the form of like cat cow, or maybe the teacher just cues, I don't know, interlace your fingers behind you and horse and then lift your chest and come into a back bend. Like I sometimes see that too. Mm -hmm. So the point being, we don't seem to tend to worry about being in horse stance with that similar wide-legged feet out. We don't really worry about that in and of itself, and we don't seem to hesitate to teach a back bend in that position. Yet, for some reason, when it comes to wheel pose, we must keep the feet, you know, hip distance and pointing forward, and not let the the thighs splay wide. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What I'm describing? Yeah, it seems inconsistent. <laughs> Exactly. I think With it's a the, good, yeah. the detail that the hip angle 
hip flexion is versus different. full hip extension is different. But, but then if we want to, yeah, what's the button? <laughs> but in, if we look at the strength training world, mm -hmm. we see another exercise that could give us some clues as to whether this is a bad idea. And <laughs> that exercise is called a hip thrust, which is really just mm -hmm. a glute bridge with the shoulders elevated on a bench. Oh, and right. oftentimes the hip thrust in a strength training context is performed in a loaded way. So you have, yes. it could be, could be anything on your waist, but it's often a barbell. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a pretty heavy barbell up to like yes. 600 pounds, yes. <laughs> um, not for the, the mere mortal, but uh, right. some people go really heavy with this exercise. And mm -hmm. in that position, they don't worry about whether the, <laughs> uh, the feet are wide and the knees are splayed in, uh, into a position of hip abduction or whether mm -hmm. the feet are hip width apart and the, the knees are hugged in tighter. It's just whatever is going to be most comfortable for the individual and allow yeah. them to produce the most force in their hip thrust is the self-selected position that they put themselves in. Whether that's, like I said, toes forward, toes flared, hips uh, relatively in tight or out wide, there's mm -hmm. nobody's nobody's like coming around a finger with a... and saying yeah <laughs> you putting, putting a block in between block everybody's between. legs that are wide oh you can't do it like that uh and it's totally it's safe. people people aren't getting hurt any which way right. they do it and they're going pretty heavy on that so that's that is similar in that case we're not we're not in spinal extension and in mm -hmm. fact they're really in that exercise trying to cue away from that but it is full hip extension like wheel that's right with that's right with a bunch of extra weight tons of across weight. your waist potentially exactly. tons of weight so in terms of inconsistencies it's like if super heavy hip thrusts are taught all the time in like a strength and conditioning con or a fitness context you know across the nation and the world then in a yoga in yoga studios where people are but it's body weight only there's no extra load we're talking about lifting up into wheel pose and the feet and the legs might be a little wide. Like, do we really need to be worried about that or really insisting, you know, for the sake of injury prevention or not jamming the SI joint, mm -hmm. like for those reasons, is it actually important? Right. And Travis, you and I made a video about this that actually is on YouTube. Um, I think we'll, and we will link it in the show notes. Do you remember this one? I think it's called I like, do. should we, yeah, should we turn, is it bad to turn your feet out and wheel? It's something like that. Yeah. And I think another thing we talked about in that video, actually, that you said from my memory is that um, it oh. actually could, <laughs> no, it's a good thing, um, is that it actually could be advantageous to turn your feet out and let the legs go a little wide because that position of abduction, that's what's what that's called when the legs are wide, can put gluteus maximus, like your big glute muscle, in a position to potentially work more favorably. I think you said yeah, that maybe. in that video. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think different people are able mm. to produce force strongest in different degrees into hip extension in different degrees of abduction. So it's like, right. okay, well, try it narrow, That's try so it true. wide, try it in between, see what feels best to you. And I think that that would apply equally well to wheel as it does in a hip thrust. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe people can, yeah, like you said earlier, like self-select a position in which they feel strongest. You know, yeah. and the, the body probably will, will kind of know how to do that and put them in that position. So if yoga teachers then come around and want to place these arbitrary, you know, the straight line and the right angle ideals, these aesthetics we like to see, you want to layer that onto a student where you see that their legs are a little wide. Instead, you want to see the parallel lines of the thighs, you know, hip distance and the feet hip distance. It's just you're probably going to disadvantage that student, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's likely that you will by layering on mm -hmm. such a such an aesthetic. Yeah. I think we've talked yeah. about it, presume maybe in the squat. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we haven't, but it's kind of similar. Oh, it. do toes need to be straight ahead or could toes be out? If you force somebody to have toes straight ahead, that could actually put them in a more compromised position than if you allowed them to go toes out based on the anti version or retro version yes. of their hip socket. 100%. And that, that same exact thing applies in wheel 
Totally, totally. So maybe kind of let students figure, figure, let their body self, self-organize into the pose that, the, the, that supports them the most kind of naturally mm -hmm. could be like just a base way that we approach it. Of course, we may choose in certain times with certain intentions to do a variation of wheel. Like today we are going to hug in because we want for this reason, you know, but not because it's yeah. correct and right, but just because it may offer right. something different. It feels nice <laughs> hugging the block in yeah. and creating that yeah. adduction stimulus, like yes. zippers up the, I don't know. I've heard that oh, before, yeah. like zippers up the core. Too. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. It feels good. It's like uh, in a, you could, you, if you were in Pilates, you might use a Pilates ring for a Oh yeah, bridge. yeah, yeah. You yeah. And hugging hug in. The, the ring in. It feels great. But you could so equally true. well put a mini band around your knees and push out. And push out. And that's the exact opposite thing. And we're talking, this is usually in glute bridge uh, or in right. rest, shoulder mm -hmm. elevated glute bridge, not necessarily in wheel, but I don't see why. I don't we see why not in wheel either. Totally. So it's kind of like there are many options and possibilities, maybe explore them all, but we don't necessarily just need to narrow, you know, put ourselves in these boxes of like, this is the one right, right way. And if you don't do it this way, you'll blow out your SI joint. Something like that. Mm -hmm. So Travis, what do you think? Can we move on to our next? I think Let's this next it. one's a pretty good one. I mean, I think these are all pretty good, but this one I think is extra good. Mm -hmm. This rule, this yoga alignment rule, um, I believe this is common out there. I don't know. Maybe it's these days it's a little less common, but I surveyed my social media audience on this one fairly recently and well over half of people had heard this cue. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a feeling our audience members will be semi familiar with it, but this has to do with plank pose and specifically the transition into plank pose. Uh, what is this rule about getting into plank pose, Travis? When you are in a forward fold, you mm -hmm. are not supposed to jump back into plank. That's it's right. It's acceptable to jump back into chaturanga and encourage, mm -hmm. but it is not, it's red X on jumping back into plank with straight arms because that is supposed to be too jarring Mm -hmm, on the mm -hmm. arms or the shoulders or the wrists or all of the above. 100%. Yes. And um, yeah, I've had that taught to me so many times. I, I maybe in my older days of teaching used to teach that too, because again, just, you know, something I heard it, it was supposed to be important and I didn't realize there could be another way, but uh, yeah, uh, it's pretty wide. Yeah. So just these ideas, like if you land in plank with straight arms, you can injure specifically the upper body, the shoulders, the wrists, things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we have a couple things to point out about this cue, but you, Travis, came up with a really great kind of counter example to where we also move similarly on straight arms. Uh, and it's very, it's a very similar movement, yet we don't worry. We don't worry about the same thing. Can you tell us what that is? What yeah, is that? so that's called the jump through transition right. where you start in down dog. And this mm -hmm. is admittedly a pretty challenging transition, but right. you start in down dog and then you hop your legs up. So you're momentarily weightless and then mm -hmm. you float your legs through the window that your arms are making, usually having to do some sort of crisscross applesauce yeah, of the legs to yeah. then wind up in dandasana. Right? That's right. Yeah. Which is like okay. a seat, uh, staff pose sitting with your legs straight out in front. Yeah. So it's, super... so it's kind of the opposite in, in terms <laughs> of which direction you're moving from and to. Mm -hmm. And it is down dog instead of plank. But I would contend that this is from the standpoint of loading the upper body, yeah. pretty similar of a range of motion. And it's yeah. okay to do it in one direction moving forward, but not okay to do it in the <laughs> other direction, direction moving back. And I don't quite understand that. I don't, I, I have never heard anybody point out that inconsistency before. I just think it's really insightful that you saw that. And you mentioned that the jump forward is down dog and it's not plank. And you're totally right. But I think I would suggest that when you're in down dog and you're jumping forward, your shoulders are inevitably going to shift forward to where mm -hmm. it's kind of like they're in a plank-like position anyway. You know, you might have started back mm, yeah. in down dog, but 
once you jump forward, the shoulders do come over the wrists as though you were in plank. So yeah, I, I it's more about like the hips small. starting in a different place. That's right. That's right. So yeah, it's like nobody worries about it when you're jumping forward and through your arms. Yet we tend to hear a lot of cautions about jumping back um, from forward fold, like back to like, this is basically back to then you're going to do your vinyasa, basically. That's yeah. just so like in a sun salutation, you're you just you should land in bent elbows chaturanga because because that's supposed to cushion that's supposed to be less jarring for the upper body because you land with bent elbows. Um, this actually could take us to like the second point that we wanted to make about this jump forward, jump back situation. And we have a, a YouTube video about this and um, we're going to link it in the show notes. I don't think, Travis, that we've actually talked about this on the podcast before, though. So this mm -hmm. could be this is a good opportunity to share this news that I when you saw this, when I was telling you about this alignment rule a while ago, and then you you pointed this thing out about what's actually happening when you jump to plank and where the impact actually is and is not I was like, really, my mind was blown. I was just like, you know, just the way you you're moving. I sure. saw it. I think in the yoga world, we just don't we have this, um, you know, biased view of the way we look at these movements. But you were just like, well, wait a second. Uh, what did you notice about the jump back to plank and the, the idea of impact yeah. and jarring? So the the concern, the jarring, the the yoga lens is looking at the arms. Mm -hmm. But when I watch it, I say, well, wait a second, what's taking the impact? Isn't it the legs that are doing the <laughs> jumping? A That's and right. the arms are just are just hanging out. I mean, <laughs> they are supporting load, right? Um, right. but it's really what's making the impact that what's going up into the air and then back down is the legs. So that's right. It, it's more the like, stay. yeah, if you, so if you were, and in the YouTube video, I explained this, if you were to do a vertical jump, a mm -hmm. squat jump, so you're standing, you bend the knees, you jump up into the air and you come back down. We would t advise that you want to land with soft knees. You don't right. want to land with your legs straight, straight because that that admittedly is there's some jarring <laughs> that's going on there because you're not using your muscles to absorb the the coming back down to the ground mm -hmm. but that's not what's going on in <laughs> this transition what what would what would have to be going on in this transition would be more like if you started in a kneeling position mm -hmm. and then you fell forward and you caught yourself with straight arms. That's right. So you you were in a, a kneel, you were in tall kneeling, and then you uh, wound up in a bent knee plank. That's and right. And instead mm -hmm. of cushioning yourself with your hand uh, by bending your elbows and going into a bit of a chaturanga, you just landed bolt straight with your arms. Mm -hmm. And I acknowledge that that would be jarring for the upper body. But that's not what's happening in this transition, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, and, and, that, and that, yeah, that's a separate exercise that I sometimes see in strength training of doing the kneeling fall uh, and, yeah. and being able to catch yourself like that. Great exercise. But that's, that's different from what we're talking about with this, oh, don't ever jump back into plank. So that's what they're, they're cautioning against, oh, that's going to be jarring on the upper body, but it's really not because... There's no impact. There's in the no upper body. impact. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like the arms are planted and everything else just moves relative to the arms, right? And your feet land and they impact, but you never land mm -hmm. on your hands in that transition. Right. So why are we so worried about the impact on the upper body? Because there isn't any. And right. again, um, I think you did a marvelous job describing that, but I do acknowledge, you know, again, this is like an audio or, you know, format. So it's, it might be a little tricky, but I definitely recommend people just go watch our video. It's like under two minutes long. It's really fast and it demonstrates all of that perfectly. So if you're not clear about that, go, go watch it. But um, yeah, thanks for explaining that so well. It's like, why are we worried about this? Yeah. So yeah. Um, yet another inconsistency. And uh, that's the jump back to plank discussion. Uh, should we move on to our next item on the list? Mm -hmm. This one is a biggie. Uh, I just put up a post just the other day of a movement that involved this and someone was like, ah, I think that's a really worrisome transition. So just mm. it's like is out there. This transition that we have a yoga alignment rule about is that we should not transition from what are called 
closed hip positions to open hip positions. And sometimes I also hear these called, um, quote, neutral hip positions to external hip positions, like neutrals to externals, but more commonly I hear closed hips to open hips. Hmm. So um, there's this idea uh, that we shouldn't trans we shouldn't transition back and forth and what these are just so so we have an idea of them. These are it's mostly standing poses we're talking about and a closed hip standing pose would be something like warrior one or high lunge where we're basically forward facing toward the front of the map. And then an open an open hip position would be warrior two. And we do commonly see like a transition from say high lunge or warrior one, and then you turn open to the side into warrior two or turning from warrior two back to warrior one or back to high lunge. So the transition between those two would be moving from a closed to an open hip position. And we're not supposed to do that according to many people in the yoga world, but there are admittedly some people out there who are like, I've never heard that rule and I teach that all the time, but lots mm. of people have heard this rule. Uh, warrior one to warrior two is a no-no in many schools of thought, but what's even more of a no-no is when you're actually standing on one leg because mm. then there's like more load involved. And then a similar closed open would be warrior three. And again, just, just kind of assuming our listeners can picture what these poses are. You know, we're just kind of saying these words quickly, but warrior three, single leg balance when you're facing down and then half moon where you turn open to the side, you stack your hips and everything is side facing. You're not supposed to go from warrior three to half moon or from half moon to warrior three. Okay. So does that so make that sense? Was, Do you think I, I explained? Yeah. I, that was my question. So you said, don't go closed to open, but could you go open to closed? So no, if you somehow started either. in half moon and then That's I don't right. know how exactly you would kick up into that, but, uh, maybe you know, you could. It could, you could, you could slowly rotate. It'd be a big balance challenge, or maybe, yeah. uh, maybe you had your hands down and you transitioned into what's called standing splits. Um, okay. I don't know if you're, you know, these standing, I think maybe you do, but that would be a similar, like turning the hips down from half yeah. moon. You could definitely go warrior two to warrior one. No, you're not supposed to do that either. You're not supposed I to mean, go in either direction. That would be easy to do. This oh! is, this rule is saying oh, yes. you shouldn't do that. So it's not just, oh, <laughs> right. don't go warrior one to, into warrior two. It's don't go in either direction from one pose to the other. That's right. You are because, not supposed to transition. Yeah. Do you know why, Travis? Because it will shred your labrum. <laughs> it's a labrum, What's your labrum shredder. It's that's in your hip. Your hip. Your labrum? hip socket. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of it's a connective tissue it lining in there. <laughs> I believe it's like this lining in your in your um, hip socket. It lines the acetabulum, which is the hip socket, and then it pokes out further than just the rim of the hip, and it. Uh, of the hip socket and it just kind of helps uh add stability and it helps keep the head of the femur the thigh bone hugged into the hip socket it's like a lining in there and it's called a labrum and you also have a labrum similar in the shoulder because both the shoulder joint and the hip joint are ball and socket joints and they both can move in many similar ways maybe mm -hmm. just about all the same ways uh shoulder joint and hip joint so that's the idea. Yeah. And that is what you hear. What I at least can experience having heard is you will shred your hip labrum if you do those transitions, because I don't, it's like, um, I've heard it described before as like a, a mortar and pestle. Do you know what that is, Travis, a mortar and pestle? Nope. <laughs> I know that in, um, from like the cooking world and it might be something where it's like a, kind of like a bowl. And then, um, I don't know, this like, it's not, oh. a, it's like a rounded stick and then you grind with it. Like I you might grind spices is. down, you know, you, you probably yeah, seen those Okay. Before. Okay. You might not have known that's what it was called. No. Um, yeah, like you can grind whole spice down into ground spice with a mortar and pestle. Like fennel. <laughs> yes, precisely like fennel. That's a great example. I need one of those. I have some yeah. whole oh. fennel that I'd like to grind. Okay, good to next, know. Next Christmas. So, yeah, totally. So if you can <laughs> picture uh, what the mortar and pestle looks like, and you could picture that as being your hip socket, and um, the head of your thigh bone. That's kind of the, the idea is that you're grinding down the hip labrum. Hear this all the time. Uh, so what, what's the inconsistency that we have to, to demonstrate about this? Well, or highlight? I could think of there, I could think of a few reasons why this is silly, but the mm -hmm. best analogy is that we do it all the time for the upper body. That's right. The shoulder, as you mentioned, also a ball and socket joint. 
when we rotate from plank to side plank, which nobody exactly. ever bats an eye at. No. Because why would you? Yet right. it's the same. It's the same. It's saint. just like warrior one to warrior two. Or warrior three to half moon, going from plank to side plank and vice versa, right? Travis going from side plank back to plank would be mm -hmm. the same as going from like half moon to warrior three. Mm -hmm. Nobody bats an eye when we do the same movement. And if we want to be really anatomical about it, we can say that it's um, that's that movement at both the shoulder and the hip. It's technically, we could call it closed chain because it's closed chain because the distal end of the limb is fixed on the floor. So in plank, mm -hmm. uh, your hands on the floor in the standing poses, your foot's on the floor and then you're rotating, uh, you know, your body at the joint uh around around <laughs> so it's closed mm -hmm. chain shoulder rotation or closed chain hip rotation that's mm -hmm. the anatomical term for like what that yeah is. and at the in the side plank to front plank or vice versa it's horizontal abduction yeah although yes, it is. i don't it is. i don't call it that at the hip <laughs> i've never heard oh i think we've i've never heard horizontal before. abduction yeah but maybe maybe you have I ha yeah, I think we talked about how you would not learn it that way. And I had, I had learned it at the hip. It's also called yeah. that. And anyway, it's a little technicality, but, but I think yeah. we could loosely say it's closed chain, hip and shoulder rotation. Like you're rotating mm -hmm. with the distal end of the limb fixed, um, and, and everything's moving around it. Yep. So that's a very, just a normal, natural movement that the human body can do. Like we can do open chain, hip rotation and shoulder rotation, and we can do closed chain. Like the, the human body can. It, you know, it's built to do that. It's like part of how we mm -hmm. move. We also do it really reg regularly in daily life, right? Don't we? Right. So it's a, it's okay for the upper body, but it, in the yoga context, but it's not okay for the lower body in the yoga context. Yet every time you make a ninety degree turn, you are walking <laughs> one direction. You decide to turn. You plant the leg. Turn the opposite way. You've 100%. done closed chain hip rotation and your labrum has not shredded yet no way and you've done that on one i mean if you're turning you take a step so for that mini moment you're on one leg yeah it's, it could mm -hmm. be it's one leg yeah so if you if your last step is your right leg this would be opening up your yeah. left foot and then making a 90 degree turn to the left and unless we always through our daily life always just walk straight forward uh you know never turn I think that like, that would be the only time, the only way that we would not be doing this in daily life. Right. Close right. Chain yeah. Hip. Or like take the last few steps and then take like mini steps to turn. To yeah. I was thinking that, or maybe you would jump to turn or something. Oh, like do perfect. A hop and then rotate and then land. That would be really funny if that's how we like got around. Yeah. Um, like a kangaroo. Now in, in addition, yeah, exactly like a kangaroo. In addition to pointing out um, that we do this in daily life, there is also, I think, important to point out is there's also an actual exercise in, um, I see it prescribed in like the physical therapy world a lot, but it maybe it's also just like a, a general fitness exercise. Do you know mm -hmm. the one I'm talking about? I do. I'll tell you. It's if you called remember. the hip airplane. Exactly. And you do exactly this transition over and over and over again. And the idea is that you're working on your hip mobility while balancing. So that it's, One. this is when you're in warrior three and you open up to half moon. And sometimes yeah. we'll even work into like, I don't know what you would call this, but we're trying to get more internal rotation. So we'll go like even oh, yeah. deeper, more mm -hmm. into the closed position, the warrior three like right, past right. warrior three and then open yeah. up into half moon all the way up it's a great movement it can be strengthening for the hip rotators and um yeah it can be like a good thing to do right it could be a positive exercise that's beneficial for the hips totally in that context yeah so just to uh yeah just to kind of highlight and take a look at some inconsistencies surrounding this is like a long like old, long time old alignment rule that I, at least in my experience i think it's been kicking around in yoga land for a long time but hopefully by highlighting some of these inconsistencies that surround it both within yoga in general and then like compared to just outside uh daily life off the mat and then actual strength exercises if you consider hip airplane a strength exercise, which I think it could be, mm -hmm. um, all yeah. of those, like in none of those, in none of those situations, do we worry that we're shredding the labrum, but for some reason in yoga, like warrior one to warrior two, you're shredding the labrum. 
So I think, you know, biomechanically, yeah. that's not what's happening. And it's probably not something we need to say or teach or uh, transitions that we need to avoid. You know, yeah. it's but fine. If, yeah, yeah, again, everybody, every time you post something like this, you inevitably get those comments. Isn't that dangerous? Like I've, totally. I've seen it. Yeah. Many times. And like I said, just the other day, the person. Yeah. yeah. So people are um, holding on to this one for sure. They are. It's interesting. Um, and I feel like we could we could talk about this one more, but because of, you know, our timing, maybe we should hop on to our next yoga alignment rule that doesn't make sense. Now, this one is tree pose. Mm -hmm. This one is tree pose. And um, how it's always often taught in yoga that you should not place your foot, your tree pose foot on your inner knee of the standing leg. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. put your foot on your knee in tree pose. So tree pose is single leg balance and you pick up the other foot and you place that foot somewhere along the inner leg of the standing leg but we are often taught i don't know 80 90 percent of the time we're taught to place that tree leg foot either below the knee or above the knee but never place it directly on the knee mm -hmm. right why are we not supposed to why do yoga teachers say we shouldn't do that the concern is that when we make that foot placement into that like external figure four looking shape that if you put it right on the knee, then it's pushing the knee into a bow legged position mm -hmm. or anatomically refer to that as knee varus, which is That's the opposite right. of knee valgus, which is a knock knee position, which people also worry about, but not in this context. So <laughs> anyway, right. Right. by putting the foot right on the knee, you're pushing the knee in right in the frontal plane, uh, out to the side Mm -hmm. to this bow-legged position, which is thought to be problematic, dangerous. Uh, Injure for the, the knee. Yeah, the lateral collateral. Lateral collateral ligaments, I think. Yeah. If any, if a yeah. teacher is going to say the structure, I would think that would be the structure. They wouldn't say, but... <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't say, yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, if you, if you put a huge varus force, then that mm -hmm. would put a tensile, put stretch on the lateral collateral lateral collateral ligaments of the knee which are the ones that are on the outside of the knee of the knee that makes a lot, i think you you described that really well i think we can all picture that so that's the rule that's the yoga alignment rule no foot on knee and tree and that's their justification so travis mm -hmm. what's the inconsistency that we'd like to present yeah so another pose that we'd make a tree leg in is side plank Mm -hmm. So you're in side plank and then you take the top leg and yeah. you place it in either, like you just described, whether that's on the shin or on the inner thigh. So it's, you're still not told, you're still told not to put it on your knee in side plank. Right. But when you're in side plank, your relationship to gravity is different, right? So the weight is on your outer bottom foot instead of yeah. on the bottom of your foot going straight up. So when the your weight is on your outer foot and you're creating hip abduction to maintain mm -hmm. your side plank, That's no right, matter yeah. where you put your foot on, where you put your tree foot, whether it's below or above the knee, you're still creating varus <laughs> force on the knee because right. you're all of the forces are now conspiring against you uh, because of the hip and the, the ground reaction force at the foot to yeah. when you, when you place that foot, the tree foot on the knee, no matter where you place it, it's going to be pushing the knee out, out and nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> nobody Nobody's cares. worried about that in, in a side plank tree, but in a Why standing aren't they tree. worried? <laughs> Travis, I have a quick question for you. So you've said um, si specifically side plank where you add the tree leg. What if you mm -hmm. were in side plank and you were just in side plank and you didn't add the tree, either just like stack legs or maybe you hovered the top leg straight? Is there oh, yeah. still Same a varus force? Okay. So it doesn't have to be side plank tree. It's just any <laughs> right. side plank. Any it's side still plank, a but it's, it would be exacerbated by having the foot in tree. Got it. Okay. So I think the point here is if the concern in yoga is that in standing tree, you place your foot on the inner, if you place it right on the inner knee, that's going to create a, add a, apply a varus force to the knee, a bow legged force. And that's bad. 
so we shouldn't do mm -hmm. that. But then mm -hmm. in side plank, any variation of side plank, but more if you add tree, is always a varus force on the knee, right? It's always a lateral force. And we don't worry about it there. Like we just kind of think side plank, you know, it's just, it's a strength building pose. It's going to strengthen the hip. We don't worry about that. We don't even think about it with the knee there. Like it's not a problem mm -hmm. there, but it's a big mm -hmm. problem when we're standing. Mm -hmm. That's an inconsistency, right? Totally. And um, I think we, I think we could say more about this one, but actually I'm, I think I'm going to, I'm going to encourage us to maybe, maybe leave our point there. Um, there is a blog post that I have about this exact about this exact mm -hmm. issue. We'll link that in the show notes. It's about tree pose and placing the foot on the knee. But once again, just using inconsistencies across yoga asana to suggest that perhaps this is uh, a yoga alignment rule that um, we don't we don't need to be saying. Uh, maybe it's not necessary. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about that, but I think I think we'll we need to move on. And Travis, I'm actually going to suggest that. These next couple on the list that we have here, we act, I think I'm going to suggest we skip them because we actually talked about these in our chair pose podcast episode, mm. chair pose, knees over toes and um, other woes or whatever. So that's episode, <laughs> tw uh, episode 20, I'm pretty sure that is. And um, I Good think memory. we can, we've talked, thank you. <laughs> uh, they're very interesting, but I think we should skip them because we've talked about them. And I really want us to get to, well, this last one and then Sarah Page's. Perfect. So um, let's do that. Does that sound good? We'll mm -hmm. do this last one that we came up with, and then we'll move to Sarah's too. And then that's going to conclude our list. So um, our last yoga alignment rule that doesn't make sense, inconsistency. This one we have talked about before, but we want to talk about it again. This is downward facing dog and hand wrist alignment. And what what do we tend to hear? What's What's the yoga alignment rule about the hands in down dog? So they say that you want to ground down through the base knuckle of your index finger. Mm -hmm. And what that they're trying to counteract is your inner hand kind of rolling up and away from the mat as you're mm -hmm. in down dog and that putting too much something pressure into your outer hand. Weight. Yeah, pressure. That's yeah. the word. <laughs> pressure or weight into your outer hand. Yeah. And uh, so the the counter, at, what you're supposed to do to counter that is to ground down through the base knuckle of the index finger. But then because that, and we talked about this at length, I think in our mm -hmm. last episode, because yeah, that down dog, yeah. internally rotates the shoulder, then you're supposed to externally rotate the shoulder. So you're supposed to create this inner outer spiral. That's right. Where you create an inner spiral at the forearm, but then you create an out outwards spiral to external rotate at the shoulder all just to keep you perfectly stacked i suppose except right. that your perfectly. wrist is still ahead of your shoulder <laughs> right perfectly stacked or maybe just perfectly aligned maybe they would say yeah. like you're in correct yeah, yeah. alignment perfectly like, rotated yeah. Yeah, exactly. The shoulders are rotated the way they should be. And then the wrists are, you're not rolling the weight into the outer hands. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea there is that you're, is that our body wasn't designed to bear load on the outer hand and the outer wrist. That's like the claim. And there are, as I mentioned in the down dog episode, there are articles about this out there. I actually pulled a quote from one that says, uh, this is from a yoga international article about this exact issue where the author said, um, we, so if you do let the weight roll to the outer hand, uh, quote, we not only irritate the soft tissues of the wrist, causing them to swell, but risk, we risk damaging the wrist by putting pressure on the ulnar nerve. The sensitive carpal tunnel at the center of the wrist can become inflamed as well. The hand is simply not built to bear, to take weight here. So it sounds kind of scary. And um, because of that, it's just supposed to be really bad to wear bear weight on your outer hand. So you should always roll the weight toward your inner hands. But Travis, what's an inconsistency we can present in the yoga asana lexicon where, um, I don't know, it's maybe an inconsistency about this. I can think of three. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the three? I'll do you, I'll do you better than one. So awesome. we could take this to the extreme and say, mm -hmm. well, can the outer hand bear load at all? Like, is this a problem? And we know it's not because in 
forearm plank if you mm-hmm. clasp your hands. If you clasp your so hands, yeah. not you could do forearm plank with your palms down, and that might be the more traditional way to do it. But we often also see it with the hands clasped, and in that case, our weight is on our <laughs> the pinky and lateral aspect of our hand, and nobody cares. Right. Then we put even more load through that structure in dolphin. Yes. If we're going to do dolphin with our hands clasped again, mm-hmm. which is again a variation. But then this last one takes the cake because <laughs> in headstand, yes. we, I would say that the more, would you agree that the more traditional variation of headstand is with the ha- is hands the clasped, clasped hands? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of cradling the back of the head totally yep we're on the outer edge of our hand and and we're cute all our weight all our weight is in the forearm supposed to be and yeah uh, and head uh but maybe more so even in the forearms by that's right by the by alignment rules yeah we so anyway yeah but yes you're supposed to like really have the majority of your weight in the arms and not in the head according to that traditional Right. So Which why we can we bear about at length on that headstand episode? Headstand and shoulder stand episode, yeah. So Travis, why can we bear like a ton of weight on our outer hands in headstand? Like you're supposed to bear as much weight as you can. Uh I mean, you know, according to the yoga rules. Mm-hmm. But then in mm-hmm. down dog, we can't like roll a little bit of roll a little bit toward our outer hands. It's like really gonna, you know, really damage the wrist and swell the tissue. Swelling tissues. and <laughs> damage and pressure and sensitive and inflammation and not yes. for it. unfortunately I, I just I, I would suggest that's all no see potentially nocebo language right yeah that's horrible i cringe yeah plant those ideas in our minds and then we go to yoga thinking that and then we're like uh-oh you know i rolled a little weight now i'm gonna inflame my my nerve and we just know you know the way pain works like our thoughts beliefs emotions can influence our pain so Mm-hmm. I would advocate for just taking language like that out of out of the yoga world. We don't need that stuff. Agreed. Um, so yeah, I think I think this was really this was really well said. This is a really good inconsistency to point out. Uh, once again, we have a video about this exact question. We'll link it in the show notes about about um, should we ground through the inner hands and down dog. We have a lot we're mm-hmm. linking in the show notes for this one because we have a lot, a lot of our work, you know, we can reference. Now, Travis, I'm glad um, that you told us about how in Down Dog we have this kind of inner spiral, outer spiral, um, you know, teaching around like you're supposed to inner spiral the forearm and then outer spiral the upper arm in order to find the quote correct alignment, because mm-hmm. that's going to play a role as we talk now. Uh, about Sarah Page, who suggested the idea for this episode, her uh, her suggestions for inconsistencies that she had noticed, and uh, this will play a role in her first one. So mm-hmm. I think you'll see why we wanted to talk about these two last, just because they're a little more specific and maybe a little a little tougher to describe, like visually. Best for but last. let's talk. Yeah, exactly. Best, yeah, but they're really good ones. They're really good ones. So let's talk about uh, this this discrepancy that Sarah had found. I thought this was so insightful. I had never thought about this before. But um, she has noticed that in a seated wide-legged forward fold, so we call that Upavishta Konasana in Sanskrit in yoga. So you're seated, the legs are wide, and you fold forward. We often hear this cue that we're supposed to externally rotate our hips here. So it's often cued, you know, like roll the thighs so that the inner thighs lift, they roll up and the outer thighs roll back, or maybe let the toes roll out, point out. So that's just kind of a common language we hear in that pose. However, Sarah points out that in a standing wide-legged forward fold, and this would be called Prasarita Padasanasana in Sanskrit, in a standing wide-legged forward fold, we are very often cued to internally rotate the thighs and the hips. And this is more like spin the inner thighs back type of language. Uh, or uh, I often hear the cue in, in that specific standing forward fold to like go pigeon toed. So point your toes mm-hmm. toward each other, you know, so they angle in in order to get that internal rotation. So I think that's a really good example of like, those are basically the same position, but one is standing and one is seated. So a different orientation of gravity, but it's like the same joint position. And for some reason, there's this tendency 
that when we're seated, we're supposed to, you know, really focus on external rotation. That's really important. But when we're standing, we're supposed to really focus on internal rotation. What do you think about that, Travis? I cannot, <laughs> I cannot reconcile that. I, I think both internal and external rotation are just fine in both. A hundred percent. Which I think speaks to, well, if you can have either extreme existing in the same position in a different orientation of gravity, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe exactly. both are fine. Maybe we don't need to red X and green check mark because exactly. you can practice it however you want or both ways or not at all. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a nice exploration to cue it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think people sure. will say, well well, if I don't cue it, then what do I say instead? Yeah. And you could say yeah. nothing at all, or you, you could, could say, say try this, try that. What does that feel like? What does that feel like? Exactly. There are a lot of things we could say instead of these, like I would claim are kind of like nitpicky, unnecessary cues, maybe micromanaging cues, a term we talk about a lot on the podcast. There's a lot we could say instead, or we could just not replace it with anything and just let people experience the shape, feel the stretch. You know, um, and actually, you know, there's more we could say about this wide-legged forward fold example. Uh, I, I think I just want to throw out there that I think it's similar to in Down Dog, you talked about the outer spiral and inner spiral of the arm that uh, I think it's similar with the lower body. Often we hear in yoga, this is this is common. I don't know that everybody's heard this, but in a lot of standing poses, the, the cue is that we're supposed to inner spiral the inner thighs, like the hips. And then we do this outer spiral complementary action where we're, where we're supposed to like tuck our tailbone slightly. It's like a slight posterior tilt. And those two mm. actions are supposed to be what we need to do in order to embody correct alignment. Um, so that's, it's the same kind of inner spiral, outer spiral idea, but like with the lower body, whereas in down dog, we tend to see it in the, in that example with the upper body. But I don't know. I just, I think inner outer spiral can be interesting. You know, we could explore it. It's just not something totally. that needs to be done for correct, incorrect, you know? Uh, and go. Sarah's example of how the, the same shape in two different relations to gravity is taught differently. It's just, does it really matter? Um, let's talk about Sarah's last point and then we can wrap up our excellent mm -hmm. list here. This one, I wonder what our audience will think of this. I can totally relate to what she's saying. Um, we'll see. We'll see. So Sarah has noticed that in bow pose, this is Dhanurasana pose. This is a, you're on your belly and then it's a back bend. So you basically reach back and grab your ankles in a, in a back bend. That's bow pose. Mm -hmm. And you Shh. kick into your hands. That's right. right. And pull, pull back. Yes. To create the lift. To create the back bend. Exactly. Exactly. So you're kicking back and that creates like this, like lift of the chest and, I like bow pose. So anyway, mm -hmm. Sarah noticed that generally bow pose is taught where you grab your outer ankle, you reach mm -hmm. back and you grab the outer ankles. And um, I've seen sometimes a variation taught where you grab the inner, but it's always taught as like, this is a very different way to do the pose and like, let's do it this way today. And it's like this whole thing to describe how you get the inner <laughs> instead of the mm -hmm. outer. Um, mm -hmm. So I agree with Sarah that the default is that you grab the outer. And then Sarah's mm -hmm. noticed that in dancer pose, so now we're talking Natarajasana, standing single leg balance, where it's it's a back bend. You reach um, one arm back and you grab the foot. You can actually also mm -hmm. reach up and overhead. That's a different variation, but let's just talk about yeah. reaching back. So Sarah has noticed that usually, but she admits that this is a little more mixed and I agree with her, but usually yeah. dancer is taught that you reach back and you hold the inner ankle instead of the outer. And Travis, you and I looked, we went on Google images and we looked just to see, you know, how, you know, dancer pose and what the majority of the images were. And yeah. I think we agreed that we, you did see both, but a little more on catching the inner. And that's been my experience and what I've seen personally. So her point was just like, you know, why does it matter either way? It's like, it's basically the same position, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Reaching back, catching your foot. Like why in bow pose is it always catch the outer and why in dancer is it usually catch it? Like, does it, does it matter? Is it important? It definitely doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. I, but why is it that way? Uh, who knows? Aesthetics? It, you like would just... think, I like consistency and you, you would think that it's the exact same thing. Like you're in a back bend, your arm is reaching back for your foot. Okay, in one, it's both your legs, and the other, it's one of your legs. But why would it right. be different in the one or the other? And I, I can't, I can't. 
reconcile it. Yeah. Except yeah. to say that it doesn't matter. Right. And, and maybe that's like the main overarching point, right? Like if we're highlighting all these examples where things are taught differently, it just kind of comes like opposite cues for the, actually the same position. It's just like, um, kind of boils down to at least in these examples we've highlighted, like how important is it from a movement science perspective, right? Like in terms of, um, safety or performance or something like that. Is it really that important? There may, it might just be important for tradition. Like that's the way, that's the pose I'm teaching. That's what I'm teaching. And that's great. Um, yeah. Maybe it doesn't need to be about more than that. Maybe it gives us the freedom to let students explore or to present various options for people because they're all okay. Um, show different options. People can pick the one that, you know, feels like the yeah. right match for them in the moment, like empower students to make their own choices maybe rather than teacher knows yeah. the, the one way that's best for everybody. We all need to do it this way. I don't right. know. But not, not to like walk around the room and be like, no, 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 no. Yeah. We're doing bow pose with the hand on the outside as is customary. <laughs> like somebody <laughs> grabs the inside of their ankle and it's like, everybody yeah. has to stop. Right. <laughs> Johnny has his hand on the inside of his ankle. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Point being, um, these things maybe don't matter as much as they're often made to be, you know, in made to matter in the yoga world in the form of just being really insistent about really my, minute details and micromanaging sometimes to the point where someone is singled out, you know, it's just like, we can maybe step back from all of that and just take a different approach, maybe a different approach to alignment in general. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, Travis, I think we have pretty thoroughly covered, uh, these yoga alignment rules that we kind of wanted to present today is specifically embodying that kind of inconsistency quality, and maybe just suggesting why therefore, maybe they're not necessarily so important. Maybe there's a different way. Um, yeah. Do you think we co we covered everything we needed to cover today? I feel good about it. <laughs> Me too. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. Thank you.